Welcome to Brooklyn's Members TV and Podcast. I'm Steve Clark. I'm delighted today to be joined by the motorsport and aviation artist Michael Turner. Michael, it's great to have you with us today. Thank you. That's very kind. That's an absolute pleasure. Um, we're here to discuss your new book that you've published in cooperation with Chaz Parker and published by Porter Press International, the Michael Turner Collection. But before they, we discuss that rather wonderful book, how did the passion for motorsport and aviation painting start with you? Oh, well, the, uh, uh, the subject matter, of course, was um, of interest to me when I was even four or five years old as a, a small child with toy cars. And then the war came along, so um, aviation took my attention with the exploits of pilots in the Battle of Britain, for instance. Um, in fact, I remember at primary school, uh, I got a real telling off by the art teacher because I kept drawing Spitfire shooting missus lits down and she wanted me to draw square box buildings with windows in and trees. Um, and then of course, um, uh, after the war, I went to the Isle of Man with my family. Uh, my mother's cousin lived there and we happened to be there at the same time as the British Empire Trophy, the wow. first running of it after the war. Um, and my my cousin said, well, why don't we go and have a look? Oh, OK. Uh, we we uh, sat uh, on a farm gate next to a, a lane. And uh, then suddenly there was this uh, increasing uh, this noise coming from the distance. And then it got louder and louder. And, and a, a racing car, which was an ERA, burst into sight round the corner in front of us, um, the uh, the rear wheels clipped the banking on the exit and the driver raced off into the distance and um, I just thought it was the most fantastic thing it just got me straight away and um, uh, the sight and sound we actually saw the race my mother and I went to see the race for the grandstand which wasn't as exciting but um, sure. Bob Gerard won the race and I got his autograph on my program um, and that just set me off motorsport was um, it was just an incredible experience to me, and um, I, uh, my, my parents, my family, uh, I dragged around or persuaded to go to first Silverstone, first Goodwood, uh, any event that we could get to, um, and so that that sparked off the the motorsport passion, which has remained with me all my life. Mm. I thought you were going to say for one moment that your art teacher may have said to. You, Turner, you'll never be an artist. <laughs> she probably said that as well, but <laughs> <laughs> I continued that habit actually through my, uh, when I went to my proper school. Um, yeah. And I noticed that some of my old exercise books, uh, where we used to uh, write notes during a lesson, uh, in the margins there are often aeroplanes, cars, um, uh, although of course at that stage I wasn't, I didn't get into motor racing until just after the war, sure. so it was mostly aircraft. And um, uh, and I think my um, my interest was rather distracted. You know, my concentration on lessons was rather distracted by scribbling paintings or drawings, rather of aeroplanes. Wow! Oh, so, how did this uh, new book come about, Michael? Oh, um, well. I, um, as you know, I, I decided to stop doing the card collection in 2016. And um, I knew that Chaz Parker was a collector of the cards and had been for many years. Uh, but he got in touch with me and he said, look, Michael, um, uh, you've been painting the uh, motorsport, mostly Grand Prix scene for well over 50 years, mm -hmm. continuously every year a selection of subjects and um, so I think it, it, it would make a good book and I was delighted because um, uh, to paint something like that for such a long period of time mm -hmm. as a collection of cards um, was I thought quite unique really and it was mm -hmm. nice to think that it would be recorded as a as a complete collection. Um, I should say, of course, that uh, the Christmas cards formed a, a relatively small part of my a normal artistic output. 
um, with uh, is either motorsport or aviation uh, commissions from individuals, teams, uh, drivers, whatever. Uh, so the Christmas card collection was um, a small part of that, but it was a very important part because, um, as I say, and, and a continuous record of of motorsport, particularly Grand Prix racing, over such a long period of time, was um, maybe a bit unique. Indeed. I guess a forward by Sir Jackie Stewart is a good path, uh, place to start any motorsport book. How did that come about? <laughs> I asked him. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fair enough. <laughs> I'd, I'd known Jackie, well, of course, since... Um, I know Jackie since he was uh, driving, of course. Um, I remember his first appearance with PRM at Spa, particularly, where he was outstandingly good as a relative learner. Um, and um, over the years, the nice thing about the racing scene, uh, when I was involved in the 60s, 70s, particularly, and the 80s, is that you mingled with competitors, uh, teams, owners, sponsors, uh, at, at race meetings. And so I was really very fortunate in being able to get to know a lot of drivers um, on, a, on a personal basis and some more so than others. And uh, Jackie particularly, um, he had paintings from me, uh, commissioned quite a number of works over the years. And uh, particularly after he'd retired, uh, he lived uh, until he had to move over to Switzerland because of his wife Helen's dementia. Um, he lives about five miles away from me. And so we socialized as well. And I felt um, no embarrassment at asking him if he would write Absolutely. a forward. And um, he very, very uh, cautiously agreed straight away. And I th I'm extraordinarily flattered by the words that he put to the forward. Um, uh, very, very, very complimentary indeed as i said what a place to start um just going back indeed you received your very first track pass in the mid 1950s which allowed you access to each and every grand prix circuit in the world plus the indy 500 and sports car racing at le mans you've said the book is uh, really a history of grand prix racing it developed over the past 50 years if you look back at some of those early um, I'll use the word simplistic, but they certainly weren't, but classic lines of, say, Moss in the Rob Walker Lotus 18 at uh, uh, Monaco. Um, the, we've come to right up to date, and I called that 2016. The cars have become increasingly complex to draw. How have you managed to maintain that quality that is yours alone? That is certainly that race. The 61 Monaco um, was, I think, one of Sterling's best races. Mm -hmm. And I just remember it from start to finish and uh, him driving his Lotus without the side panels on so yeah, he could yeah. see his legs. And uh, um, I was a great fan of Sterling's and, you know, I forgot to know him. But um, uh, in 1950, I went to see the um, European Grand Prix with my family. Uh, who took me there um, and after the race the getting away from Silverstone in those days by car would have been a nightmare yeah. so my mother said why don't we walk, walk across the track go up the track to the paddock and have a look around all fine so I went with her to the paddock and while we were looking around I uh, came across Sterling's Cooper with which he I think had won the 500cc event um, and it had a the horseshoe on the headrest at the back uh, and I was looking at that and a, a gent came up and said um, why don't you sit in the car lad and I thought oh I can't sit in the car and he, he said go on go on sit in it it's okay and I sat in Sterling's Cooper 500 at Silverstone in 1950 <laughs> um, and I was I was quite embarrassed but I was took a photograph and then the chap came back he said here wear his helmet and he put his helmet on my head, and I was even more embarrassed, and I rather quickly took the helmet off, and then I got out. But my mother's photograph shows me sitting in Sterling's car, and um, 
and I really looked very uh, uncomfortable in that I was embarrassed. Um, and many years later, I, I went to see Sterling about something and uh, see that I took him the photograph and he thought it was hilarious and he said, <laughs> he said you look as if that's the last place you really want to be <laughs> embarrassed uh, but he said it was my father Alfred that um, would oh. ask you to sit in the car and give you my helmet to wear and of course that all tied in yeah yeah so, anyway, that's my my early memory particularly in connection with Sterling <laughs> our well two questions there um, Steve, and um, if I could just leap back to the, the last one, the, the point you made about uh, First Track Pass in 1951, which gave me access to any Grand Prix anywhere, whatever. That's not quite correct because um, my first track pass was at Goodwood, and it was because um, uh, because I'd been hawking my work around when I was at art school. Um, the ARC asked me if I would produce a drawing from their Whit Monday meeting and I asked for a track pass and they said well possibly but you'll need to see the press officer when you get there and I remember uh, going up to the press office uh, or the press caravan several times in the morning before the meeting started and I was each time the press officer told me to come back later <laughs> and uh, he hadn't got anything and eventually I went back in desperation about uh, 20 minutes before the start of the meeting and he said oh somebody from one of the newspapers hadn't turned up so I could have his. Uh, that was my, my first track pass um, and it was quite a revelation being out in the open rather yeah. than uh, in a spectator enclosure but it didn't lead to um, <clears throat> automatic passes everywhere else. Uh, that came <clears throat> I think as I progressed with my career, I got more work published. Um, if I wanted to go to a Grand Prix, I would have to write in and apply. And um, fortunately, in every case, um, uh, I was accepted as um, needing a track pass. So that was fine. <clears throat> and then um, in, I think, about 1970, Bernard Caillé, uh, uh, photographer, journalist, um, PR man on the Grand Prix scene, um, decided to form an organisation called the International Racing Press Association, or UPA. Uh, and I happened to be at, at Zandvoort when this was all talked about, and uh, I was accepted as a member. I was the only artist member, um, and the other members were journalists and photographers, but I worked like a photographer in those days Indeed. Uh, and that was wonderful because you had an armband uh, which had your photo on it and you could go to any you could go to any grand prix or motorsport event and uh, just show that and you didn't need anything else uh, that lasted until <clears throat> i think um probably the late 80s early 90s when um uh, the fia decided through fisa to regulate all the press uh, activities and um, Erpa was disbanded. Uh, it then became a FISA armband, which worked similarly, but after only a matter of a uh, few years, they decided they didn't want certain types of people and artists was one category that they uh, didn't show any interest in. So the obtaining of track passes Fortunately, it was not a problem for me through most of my, the important years of my career. Uh, and now, of course, it is, um, as it says in the book, I think it is now, <clears throat> it's become almost impossible to get working track passes. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> part, part of the reason for my well, disenchantment in a way or, or, or lack of progress on that. <laughs> OK, so going back to my second point, Michael, about the complexity of the modern Grand Prix car as, as opposed to the early uh, days of Colin Chapman's designs, um, which were classic and elegant. How have you coped with um, modern designs and interpreting those um, in the way that you have? Um, well, that's, that's OK. It's a, it's a um, I suppose... Um, attention to detail, um, my obsession to 
try to record things as historically accurately as I can. Um, so uh, as the cars have changed, um, there's observation goes into it, but largely the collection of reference material. So as I've traveled around a lot, um, I would, I, I use photography a lot myself, mm -hmm. um, uh, at trackside, in the paddock, wherever I could get, taking details of cars. Um, and so the, uh, the evolution was fairly gradual, uh, unlike with uh, my predecessor, uh, Roy Knockholds, who was still painting motorsport up until the 70s, I think, um, where he'd been painting pre-war. And he told me all uh, reams about 1969, I think, that um, he was no longer really interested in the cars because they started putting the engines in the back <laughs> and you couldn't see the drivers. And I thought, well, he has a point. Yeah. But, um, uh, and I think it showed in his paintings that he had rather lost interest in the subject matter because of that. Mm. Um, Fortunately, I, I did start off watching um, pre-war racing cars in the late 40s, of course, but I progressed as, as the cars changed or ideas changed, I was able to progress with them. Um, and I suppose you could say a similar thing, I hadn't thought of this, uh, might have happened to me because in 2016, I think, um, well, it was probably 2017 they introduced the halo yeah that to me was for oh, um it was a really a, an ending in a way because you can't see the driver's helmets even now no, no. whereas in, in roy's days and in my early days you could see the drivers their arms floating about and um even with their helmets on you could recognize the drivers the way he held his head, um, mm. all sorts of little idiosyncrasies. And now I think it's so anonymous that um, it, it lacks a certain element that I uh, regret, really, having gone. But does that answer your question? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, I, when you look at the early ones, I think you made the comment in the book, you can actually, uh, you've picked up the driver's eyes quite successfully um and you could tell i think one of them was jimmy clark that you said you could tell the poise the way he was kind of sitting in the car which you picked yeah. up instantaneously yes that's right and of course um even in rear engine cars initially when the drivers have laid on their backs more and more uh people like Ron trip for instance would be a tall man he would sit higher up, um, perhaps, and um, but Jimmy Clark could lie right back and uh, uh, just tilt his head forward to see where he was going. Um, and the way they, again, the way they tilted their heads in corners and whatever, they, they, they all had their individual stamp, which was not only the colour of their helmet, it was the way they moved their heads and uh, uh, when you could no longer see their their uh, their arms of course is that you could see the hands on the wheel uh, apart from that you couldn't really see them as in the old open cockpit cars but um, i was still fascinated by all those little little uh, details that uh, that goes instead i just might go on a bit about this but um uh, when i was at art school and i was hawking my work around um, I went to, amongst other places, I went to the BRDC office in um, Park Lane uh, and um, uh, Johnny St. Gibson was, uh, was there and I took some samples of my work and one of them was a picture I'd done of Hilleracy driving a Ferrari in 1951 at Reims <clears throat> and um, I based it on a photograph which showed Ascari driving his car, but the cars were basically the same, so I just changed the helmet or whatever. Showed it to Johnny St. Gibson, and he said, no, he said, that's, uh, that's Fila Racy. I said, no, it's, um, it's Ascari, it's got his number on the car. He said, yeah, but uh, Fila Racy's driving style, he's got the arms stretched, Ascari sits more hunched in the cockpit, and doesn't look like that. And from that moment, I realised how every detail you had to study so closely and um, uh, that was a, a really good uh, lesson for me 
hence my preoccupation perhaps with with um, extending the content of a painting to show uh, individual um, identities um, and the same goes for backgrounds as well. But that uh, driving style was very well pointed out to me uh, with that early mistake of mine. So leading on to that, Michael, talk us through the process of how you've created these cards over the years. I mean, how you've created them, well, I guess in terms of all your paintings, what's the process you use to get to the point that you're happy with them? Uh, right, well, it has to start off with, um, obviously, the uh, the basic subject. Um, in the case of the cards, um, that's one area where I picked my own subjects and they all were related to a particular season. So I'd choose um, which teams, which cars, which drives, which events were of most interest. Um, and um, based on all the information that I gathered, I would scribble out a few basic ideas on a sketch pad, uh, really just literally thumbnail, very simple. And from those, I would then give it some thought and pick out the ones which I thought were going in the right direction and then nail it down to one idea which I thought was pictorially the most appropriate. Um, and then uh, work that idea up a bit into a more detailed sketch. So I made sure I got all the, the details in the right places. And then the next stage would be the painting. Um, the, I suppose the, pre, the preamble uh, very often would take uh, maybe a, a half as long as doing the painting because it depends on how quickly the idea is formulated. <laughs> Well, that would apply to um, anything I do, really. I, I start off with a, with a few ideas in my head, transfer them onto paper, um, look at them and, and sort out what I think is the best. Um, oddly enough, and perhaps as a, a, an indication of this, um, if I'm commissioned to do something, I generally try to produce two or maybe three different aspects, different ways of looking at a subject. Um, but the first one is almost invariably, I think, the best one. Uh, the other ones are sort of, well, better off for you with some alternatives. And um, more often than not, it's the first one that people pick as well. Mm. Um, so that's, uh, it's really elimination, I suppose, of, um, of, of alternative ways of looking at things. Sure. Um, looking through the book, Michael, I was amazed at the number of scenes that um, you depicted in uh, wet race conditions. Has it always <laughs> been a fascination of yours, or did it just happen to <laughs> fall like that? It's, it's the way it happened. <laughs> uh, I've got. Um, I, I would always go out around the circuit, depending on, not depending on the weather. If it was, if it was dry and sunny, wet and windy, or cold. Um, I wouldn't hang around the pits. I always wanted to go out into the into the circuit for backgrounds and things. And um, uh, it just happened, I guess, that um, a lot of the subjects in the, the card series happened to be races running the wet. Um, it often provides perhaps a, a more dramatic uh, scene with spray and stuff and uh, stormy clouds but at the same time it's pretty unpleasant uh, working in those conditions I imagine uh, um, but you you have captured those spectacularly i have to say and the uh, interpretation of them is uh, truly stunning um if we can move on to the collector's club a creation which you attribute to your wife helen what was yes. the thinking behind the club um, right, well, we, we've been producing the cards um, since 60, well, City of 88 have been producing the cards since 63. Um, and um, I remember in around about 1988, I think, we had an exhibition in London, which was partly Studio 88 to um, promote prints and, and the cards but uh, also it's an exhibition which um, my son Graham and myself had of original paintings. Uh, and the first one was held in the 
Whitbury Services Club, Christoph Blavlach, um, and um, uh, Helen was we were just, just discussing this at lunchtime, and she said, well, somebody came in with an album uh, during the exhibition, uh, showing it to her of all the cards he'd collected, but he had a lot missing from the earlier years, and uh, he was trying to fit in some of the gaps. But at the time, of course, um, uh, we had spare cards going back quite a way, but not right at the beginning. Um, anyway, she she looked at this collection and um, and it was in an album uh, and she helped where she could uh, but she also was receiving letters from customers uh, who had started collecting the cards and not sending them out to people um, and asking you know if they could obtain earlier uh, earlier uh, productions and it just all gave her the idea that if she formed a collector's club she could um, let people know what cards were still available. Um, she arranged for people to exchange cards if they had perhaps duplicates in their collection and other people were looking for them. She had a, a newsletter which she sent out. Uh, that started off as a bigger list of listing of what was available, but it became a, uh, a newsy newsletter. And she used to tell people what we were doing and where I'd been and so on. She actually stopped doing the collector's sum in 2012. I uh, was quite reluctant to give that up, but you know, the the uh, I suppose the circumstances are changing, and um, and it wasn't long after that that I stopped doing the cards as well. I guess, Michael, it's a really probably impossible question to answer, but. What do you think was the best year for your collection <laughs> or the standout ones in your mind that you thought, well, that is, I've created something there? Oh, a very difficult one. <laughs> very difficult. I would say the best years, uh, most interesting and involved years for me were the, the 60s and 70s. Um, and uh, as far as favourite... I think one of my favourites actually was the one I think you mentioned, the Jimmy Clark and Sandvoort, um, yeah. not the first year, but the 1964 one. Um, an unusual part of the circuit, but um, uh, it, I think um, to me, it, it contained all the elements that I uh, would have wanted in many ways. Um, and you see Jimmy's face, you see him concentrating and uh, about to run you over. Um, but I'm sure there are other ones that I would I would equate equally um, for different reasons. Mm. I suppose one thing I would say was that I've never produced something that I felt was totally satisfactory because uh, I think if an artist ever produces something and says, yep, that's the best I can do, they might as well stop. So you've always got to have um, uh, an incentive to go on and try a bit harder. So, it... No, that's fine. Um, I had the opportunity to study uh, your book just prior to Christmas. Um, and exactly the same day that I received the book, I had a, sign, a Christmas card from Simon Taylor. And as I opened it up, lo and behold, it was one of your cards, the 1967 <laughs> BIAC 500 with a wonderful painting of the mighty seven litre chaparral 2f which appears in the book great painting thank you well I, um oddly enough i remember the, the event well and um the chaparral was a revelation um, that high wing and mm. it's a rather boxy unattractive shape really uh, but it was so different um the fact that it also won the race yeah. was uh, another reason for painting it. But um, I never found it an attractive car. But uh, in in the right setting, of course, um, uh, the right sort of angle on it, um, I guess you know it, it, it worked out fine. Um, the the setting just fitted in quite nicely. I you could, I think you could look through the struts of the wing and see Jackie Stewart behind him. I think you're right. Um, you said um, earlier on that you stopped producing the series in 2016. What made you make that decision, Michael? Uh, right. Um, I, 
I, I was 82 in 2016. Uh, so working around a circuit, especially like Monaco, which is up and down hill, is quite hard work. And uh, although I was um, as active as usual, I hope, <clears throat> um, we used to, in the, in the more recent years, um, we used to stay in Beaulieu and uh, I used to drive in and then go back to the hotel and uh, I remember going back after practice um, on the Thursday and I said to Helen, look, I'm, I'm really finding this quite exhausting really, um, but it wasn't only that, it was also the more and more rules and can't do's and things like that which um, had been creeping in over several years um, as opposed to the days where you could just uh, you turned up you had your credentials you could walk around pretty well much as you liked um, and um, that was stimulating in itself so uh, I suppose I was also very used to Monaco but it was the only one I was then going to Mm -hmm. uh, I I just felt um, maybe it was time to give it a miss. And uh, after the race itself, um, I guess also I felt, well, you know, I'm a bit old for this. Everybody else around me was uh, a lot younger. <laughs> so <laughs> I felt like a, a bit of a sore thumb. Um, but, uh, you know, I would have still gone on doing it if I had been able to. But the lack of facilities... Um, was a, a disincentive, shall we say, and uh, that's disappointing. I, I, it's not being grumpy, really, but um, uh, it, uh, motor racing has been a, a large, large part of my life, and it seems such a shame to have to give it up because of um, changing in rules and regs and uh, so on and so on. Michael, before we close, I'm lucky enough to have one of your signed copies of, well, both signed by yourself and Captain Eric Winkle Brown's book, Too Close for Comfort, in which you illustrated the number of the aircraft flown by Winkle. If you don't mind me saying, I, I, I kind of put this collection up there with that book, both wonderful in their own ways and really depict a um, series of aviation and, as you say, motor racing pictures. Uh, and and uh, painting, so I commend you for that, and I'm I'm delighted to have got both books. So thank you for that. Well, thank you, Steve. That's very kind, and uh, I'm very flattered. Thank you, Michael. As ever, it's been a joy to talk to you today. I wish you continued success with the book, and hopefully, you'll be back with us at Brooklands before too long. Thank you, thank Michael. Thank you so much. Uh, that's uh, reciprocated, of course.